Amen. Acts chapter 9, I, I'm, I'm going to read you the passage starting from verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he answered, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Amen. This morning, I'd like to talk to you for a little bit on an eye-opener experience. An eye-opener experience. Amen. Uh, his Hebrew name was Saul. Desired, though as remarkable, little in start stature instead of the statesman of Saul from the Old Testament. Um, he was actually about four feet or four foot six in height. That's all the high, that's all the, the how tall Paul was. He wasn't big in stature. He was actually quite different than Saul of the Old Testament, who was head and shoulders above all of the rest. But he is obviously named Saul. He was born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a free city of the Romans, and himself a free man of that city. His father and his mother were both native Jews. Therefore, he calls himself a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, which adhered to Judah. His education uh, was in the schools of Tarsus first, which was a little Athens for learning. There he acquainted himself uh, uh, with the philosophy and poetry of the Greeks. He was a well-versed person in education. Thence he was uh, sent to the University of Jerusalem, studied divinity and the Jewish law. He tutored under Gamaliel, an eminent Pharisee, as the Bible tells us. He had a handicraft trade where he was a tent maker. This was common with those who were among the Jews that had become scholars. For the, for the earning of their maintenance and the avoiding of idleness, they took up uh, uh, an occupation, and his was tent making. And as a young man in whom the, the grace of God wrought a mighty change in his life, it's recorded for you this morning that we have read in Acts chapter 9. This is about one year after the ascension of Christ. Maybe just a little more. And uh, we, we see here that he wasn't a very good guy. That's what it appears. It appears actually that he lived, he lived to be a persecutor of the Christians. He, he was doing what he thought was right. See, we have the benefit this morning of having the Old and New Testament. We have the benefit of being able to read the stories after the fact. But that's not what Paul's life was like. All Paul knew was the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He studied who Yahweh was. He understood the Almighty God of the, New, of the Old Testament. And all of a sudden, someone comes on the scene and claims to be God. Paul is only doing what he thought was right. Here is someone who's blaspheming Yahweh. Here is someone who is, who is trying to take glory from the Almighty God. How can it be that these people would follow a man named Jesus. How can it be that he would have such a gathering and, oh, this, is, this has got to be wrong. He is well established in the education of the Old Testament. 
He has a full understanding of who God is. He has an understanding. He has learned in the university and he has learned from from the philosophers. He has learned under the tutorship of Gamaliel. He is well knowledged in the Hebrew scripture. And what he is doing is that he absolutely 100% believes he is doing what is right. And so you have you have the story in Acts chapter 7 is Paul Saul is present at Stephen's stoning as they are stoning Stephen to death. The Bible says that the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Stoning was a a common mob action of the ancient world. It was also a legal form of execution in the Torah, including the act that would be done for someone who would be accused of blasphemy. They would strip the person who was going to be stoned and they would treat him as obviously an accused criminal. The humiliation of being naked uh, under the Jewish custom was one final act before the stoning happened to make sure that the person was absolutely 100% embarrassed. And here, Stephen's accusers, the Bible says, they laid their own clothes. They took their clothes off and laid them at the feet of Saul. They were without even realizing. Yes, some could say maybe they took them off because of heat. And, and some could say that they took them off uh, according to the custom of an athletic activity from the Greeks. They could also uh, have an understanding that possibly without even realizing they are admitting their guilt of killing an innocent man. And while they're stoning Stephen, and Saul is standing in the background, the response from Stephen, don't lay this against them. They don't understand what they're doing. And there was an absolute manifestation of how powerful God is, and His face shone in front of them, and yet Saul, Paul, did not realize that he was doing something wrong. Didn't. He thought he was protecting the law. See, we we, we kind of give him a bad rap, but he, he didn't have the New Testament to go by. He's only going by what he knew of the Hebrew Scripture. And all of a sudden, somebody claims to be God. And so, as he is there with their clothes at his feet, he watches as this Holy Ghost-filled man named Stephen is stoned to death for his faith. The Bible continues in Acts chapter 8, and it says that Saul made havoc of the church. He made havoc of the church. He didn't... You know, he, he didn't come along and, and just put up a sign on the door and say, you guys are bad people. <laughs> That's not the kind of havoc he made. You know, he, he didn't let air out of the people's tires while their cars were in the parking lot during church. Okay? That's not, no, no, he made havoc. He showed up at events and hauled people out and took them to prison. He had people killed. We're talking havoc that's more than, you know, sending you a, a, a well uninformed message on Facebook. Okay, this is serious stuff that, that Saul was doing. When he was making havoc of the church, he was showing up at events and saying, uh uh-uh, uh, you are not going to compare yourself to the Almighty God of the Old Testament. That's what he was doing. He came in contact with people who he thought was blaspheming who God was. And you can read 
through chapter 8 and how this continues to go on and into the beginning of chapter 9 where I read you the text this morning. He's just going about his daily business. He's on his way to another gathering. That's what he's doing. He's breathing out threatenings, the Bible says. He's, 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 uh, he's, he's going to have a slaughter. The Bible uses these types of words. That's what we have translated into our English language. He's, he's going to a gathering and he's threatening them to slaughter them. Nothing nice about this. Even across our world. In 2019, some people cannot go to the house of God without the fear of someone showing up with the intent of slaughter. Happens all too often. And it goes back to, in Paul's case, he thought he was doing what was right. And all of a sudden, as he's on the road to Damascus, somewhere in the day, we don't know exactly what time, but somewhere in the day, the Bible says that there is a light that is much brighter than the sun. Has the sun ever knocked you to the ground any time lately? <laughs> no. This is much greater than the sun. And all of a sudden, there's a light that shines from heaven. And instantaneously, Saul, Paul, falls to the ground blind. This is, we read about the story. We, if we could just take your mind and let it wander this morning. He's walking along and all of a sudden, it's not an earthquake. You know, the, the ground doesn't shake and knock him down. He doesn't trip on a branch. He, he doesn't fall over a rock. There is a light that shines from heaven. And it causes him to fall to the ground blind. And then his attention is God. And he asks the question. Who art thou, Lord? This is not someone who doesn't know about God. He has studied the Old Testament scriptures. He knows the Torah by heart. He has an understanding of the Hebrew scriptures and passages and what they mean. He has read all 10,000 Times in the Old Testament where Yahweh is God. He's read it. He understands it. He has a full grasp of it. And he asked a powerful question. Sir, who art thou? And he's not ready for the response. He doesn't know, but an illumination happens to him instantaneously because the voice from heaven responds with, I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Curious. See, you have to understand where the name Jesus comes from. Issuous. The name Curious. We have it in our English language as Jesus. But it comes from the word curious. Curious is the same word used for Yahweh in the Old Testament. And instantaneously, his response is received. I am Jesus. Whom thou persecutest. If that was the end of the story, we could say, you know, well, 
poor Paul, poor Saul. No, what would you have me to do? What is it that you want me to change? What is it that I'm doing wrong? Do you know this morning some people just simply do not know? Most people, I would say, don't attempt to have their lives ruined. I think I'm going to ruin my life. While I'm ruining my life, I'm going to try to ruin everyone else's life. That's not usually the case with most people. Some people just don't know. Paul was one of those people. What he was doing, he thought was right. He was protecting in his mind. He was protecting the God. The name that they couldn't even mention out of respect. They come up with other words and names like Adonai. They wouldn't even say the name Yahweh. And all he was doing is in his own mind protecting the Almighty God concerning anyone who would try to claim that they were him. And yet, at this moment, at this moment, Paul's life changes. At this moment, his future is forever changed. Go and find a man named Ananias, the street called Straight. He will give you the direction. What's so interesting is Paul's life changes from this absolutely convicting moment as he lay on the ground and he's baptized by Ananias, and he's given immediate directions from heaven in verses 10 to 19. And, and from verses 20 to 22, he, he now starts and preaches the faith of Jesus Christ. And, and he's preaching his experience multiple times throughout the Bible. You will see him share his testimony of this powerful conversion. Verses 23 to 25, he is persecuted himself and narrowly escapes with his own life. They're trying to kill him now. He admitted among the brethren of Jerusalem how he preached and how he was persecuted. You can read that in verses 26 to 30. And, and for a period of time, the church enjoys a, a time of rest and quietness as mentioned in verse 31. Some people just don't know. But an illumination of the Almighty God can be had by all. We use the words revelation. There is no new revelation actually being given. It's really an illumination of who Jesus is. And then the future of each individual is changed forever. The direction of, a, of close to or possibly more than half of the New Testament is written by this man by the name of Paul. He writes to the Corinthian church and he writes a very powerful passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 3 but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Do you know who he's talking about? This is me, Paul said. The gospel was hid. I didn't know. I was lost. I didn't realize what I was doing. It was hid to me. It was hid. Verse 4. He says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Some people just don't know. That's what Paul's saying. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Notice the words that he uses in this passage. 
These are words that happened to him. I just did not know. I thought I was doing was right. And I was on the road to Damascus, and something shined into my life. And it brought a view of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can change someone's life. The only thing. Oh, there's programs that will help people. It will enhance people. It will, it will direct people. But the transformation that's required for a future changing event in someone's life is, is a revel, uh, an illumination. I almost said revelation. It's illumination of who Jesus is by the shining of this powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what he says. For we preach not ourselves. It's not us. But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. Paul steps in and he says, listen, it's not about me anymore. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Jesus. We preach Jesus. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is an explanation of what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. I called out to Lord the Almighty. And the response was, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But we have, Paul said, this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The whole experience happened so that my future could be changed. Man, either everyone's listening or it's really, really quiet in here this morning. This is what Paul is saying. We've got a treasure. The rest of my life is going to have a different direction. Everything from here on is going to be talking about my experience of coming in contact with the saving grace of Jesus Christ. He said, we have a treasure, treasure in earthen vessels. The excellency at the power of God. Power may be of God, not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. You see what Paul's saying? He's almost, he's almost sending a message to all the families that he came in contact with over the period of time that he brought so much turmoil to their life. And yet here he is now in the same boat. And he says, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. The future has changed because of what Jesus has done in a person's life. Everybody in this building this morning, every person that's watching online, every person that will watch uh, the archive, uh, you can be assured this morning that Jesus Christ will change your future forever. Forever. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what the world says. And it doesn't matter what the world portrays. You don't have to worry about the world. Your life is changed by the power of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, do we have another verse? Did I, or is that the last one? No, oh, always bearing about. In the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Oh, notice what Paul's saying. We're always talking about the power of Calvary and the power of the cross because 
It changed our life. It gave me life. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. I was on the road to destruction. The wages of my sin was death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm not telling you anything profound this morning. I'm just repeating what changed everybody in this building. What can change every person this morning is Jesus Christ. It still works. Oh. I was listening to a report this week. And I won't say uh, some of the countries. But what was so interesting is the countries that were being mentioned as having the greatest revival right now. Right now, the greatest revival are some of the most oppressed countries in the world towards Christianity. And yet... The power of Jesus Christ is taking people's lives uh, even though they're persecuted. It doesn't end it for them. Even though uh, they may be cast down, uh, they're not destroyed. Uh, There is a powerful move uh, of the presence uh, of an almighty God around the world that is changing people's lives. I listened to that report, uh, and I listened to the countries that they named off uh, of how many people are coming to an almighty God. North America has been spoiled. But there is such a hunger to find out who Jesus is. And that hunger that's been created in people's lives is the testimony that Paul talked about. Oh, he writes to the church at Rome. and He says, listen, this is what he says to them. In chapter 10, verse 14, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It's an eye-opener experience. Oh, for a period of three days, Paul's natural body was blind. But in that sense of being blinded naturally, he had an eye-opener experience of who Jesus was. And from that day forward, what he thought he had been doing right before, he became part of. He became part of it. And now he's writing to the Corinthian church. And he's telling them how awesome that experience is. All across this congregation this morning are people who did not know the Lord. Didn't know God. Some didn't know God at all, all of their lives. Some had to come to a realization when you came to the knowledge and and the possibility of making your own decision. You had to decide. But all kinds of different testimonies across this room this morning. But you had to have your own experience with who Jesus is. And because you did that, your future changed. Your future changed. And now you're on the other side of telling people, this is what I used to be. But now, This is who I am today. This is what I used to say, but I no longer say that anymore. Here's the good news of what Jesus has done for me. This is what I thought of people who followed the Lord. But since I've given my heart to Him, this is how I think now. This is what I used to share, and this is what I used to say, and this is where I used to go. But my encounter... With Jesus changed my life. It was an eye opener experience. Music come this morning.
Mm. There are so many things that one could preach from the Word of God. And as I was studying this week, and I was studying this passage, and I was reading it, and I could only imagine, could only imagine what Paul was doing. He was just trying to do what was right. And then he had an eye-opener experience. And what a transformation that took place. Our world is filled with people. They're just living according to what they know. But an eye-opener experience changes it. If you're in this building this morning and you've not experienced what God can do for you, today's a great day. Oh, he doesn't have to blind you naturally to get your attention. He allowed me to stand up here and holler and scream at you. No chance of falling asleep. I stood up here and hollered. He allows you to have an eye-opener experience without being blinded naturally. You get to hear. What Jesus can do, even if you don't know everything about him, he'll let himself be known to you, and your future is changed forever. How is that done, Pastor? How is that process? Well, you, you have a faith. You have faith this morning. And if you can activate your faith just to believe, God, I'm, I'm going to believe on you. I'm going to express my desire to understand you. I, I want to know who you are. I want to experience a transformation in my life. I want a life-changing experience. I want an eye-opener experience, God. However you want to tell him that, that this morning, he knows how you think. He knows the words that you use. You can, you can be just out front and honest with him. God, I don't know you. I don't know enough about you, but I want to learn about you. I want to understand more about you. I want to get to know you. He hears the sincerity of your heart in those type of words. And that calling upon the name of the Lord opens up the avenue for him to make himself real to you in your life. He's made himself real to many, but he'll make himself real to you if you haven't experienced him like you would like to. And as you reach out to the Lord, the Bible's very clear. You draw nigh unto him, he draws nigh unto you. You open the door of your heart, your life, to Jesus Christ, he'll walk right in. But he won't open the door. You have to open the door. You have to invite him in. You have to desire to get to know him. But as soon as you do that, there's no question about God. He's ready. He's been waiting all this time for you to have an eye-opener experience. He walks into the hallways of your heart, your life, your future, and says, this is what I can do for you. This is what I already have done for you. This is the price that I paid for your life. And you reach out to Him in absolute surrender. God, I give everything to you. I ask you, Lord, into my heart. I ask you, God, to forgive me of my past. I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sin. Something transformational happened. Because of his precious blood and the price that was paid at Calvary. The power and the authority of his word and name. Something happens. He is more ready to forgive than you are to even ask this morning. But instantaneously. Not over a period of time. Instantaneously. He will forgive you 
of your sin. Has a desire to walk with you every day. He has a desire to get to know you and you to know him like you've never experienced before. He won't even leave you by yourself. The Bible says he won't leave you comfortless. He'll come to you. He'll fill you with his spirit. The power of the Holy Ghost can live inside of our lives. We take on his powerful name in baptism. And he washes our sins away. That's the experience that Paul is talking about. He's sharing. He says it multiple times. You can read it at the end of Acts. He's, he's telling the people. He's sharing it in, in Corinthians. He's telling the Romans. He, he shares his experience that happens on multiple occasions. He had an eye-opener experience of who Jesus is. Stand this morning. I open the altar to everybody today. Every person that would like to get to know Jesus better. Every person that would like to get to know Him for the first time. Every person that would just like to strengthen your relationship with the Lord. I just opened the altar this morning. Everybody, would you step out of your pews. Step out of your seats this morning and make your way to this, this altar. Hallelujah. The Almighty God this morning is here. Hallelujah. He's, he's ministering and speaking to your heart this morning. It's an eye-opener experience. You say, Pastor, I've already had this experience. Thank God for it. Pray for people who don't know. Uh, pray for people this morning that's never experienced it. To all the ministers this morning, I sent a little note. We pray to God in the name of Jesus. And we pray to Jesus as God. Let that powerful presence right now oh, fill this altar. Don't, 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 take, don't take it for granted this morning. Hallelujah. The eye-opener experience that you've had. Hallelujah. 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 Every nation. Every person. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.